Oops. He Hello. Hello, Lisa. How are you? Great, thank you. I interviewed you once a long time ago. Yes, I remember. Yeah, when you came on the program, you just and yes, yeah, yeah, yes, and you just you just been elected, which was very exciting. So this session will go live in about uh uh that well it says twelve seconds time. So just to warn you, people will then be able to hear us. We'll be coming into the room. We we'll wait for people to get in. Then I'll do an introduction to you so you can give your keynote, and then I will put to you the questions that people are asking, um, in there. So it should be um. Uh, straightforward um, and um, you'll see the timer all the time counting down so you know where you are with that and people are coming in already hello everyone who's coming in already um, we will just wait a moment for everybody to be here We were debating, should there be music as people file into the room or would that be a bit like sort of lift Muzak? Would that be annoying? Is a moment of mindfulness better um, while we uh, wait for, for everybody? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. So yes, there are lots and lots of people. I can see lots of you from just how, how long if you were falling in life so much longer. So for our first keynote, we are lucky enough to have the first clinical psychologist to be elected as an MP, Dr. Lisa Cameron. And I can remember interviewing Lisa on All in the Mind on Radio 4 when she was a brand new MP in 2015. Now she is shadow SMP spokesperson for mental health. And Lisa also chairs the Disability and Health All Party Groups in Parliament and just constituted an all party group for psychology. Um, and before that, she was a forensic clinical psychologist for more than 20 years. So well, Welcome, Dr. Lisa Cameron, MP. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you also to the Division of Occupational Psychology for inviting me to speak to you today. It's a great privilege to be speaking with fellow psychologists this morning. The issues discussed within your conference this year are absolutely of the moment, I believe, because over the past 12 months, our work lives have seen changes like never before experienced. We're having to adapt to new ways of working, to working flexibly from home, holding meetings and conferences on Zoom and other applications just as we are today. And the psychology of these changes will be absolutely profound. In terms of our coping, our mental health, styles of working, support structures at work, ability to feel part of a team at work, and in terms of our work-life balance. So although working from home has many advantages from reducing travel, um, climate change um, in terms of uh, reducing uh, emissions, uh, the associated costs that some people may have had in terms of um, work costs and also reducing some time spent traveling um, and away from family, it also in many ways blurs the lines between work and home life um, which creates um, difficulties uh, for people in terms of switching off. And also for many who may live alone during the past year, it's also increased isolation and perhaps many mental health issues across our communities. So moving ahead, I think the challenges we face are stark. Many jobs may change almost unrecognisably from that which we signed up to as staff members. Some companies, unfortunately it may not survive this pandemic crisis and others may develop or flourish in ways not expected adapting to the changes that are in suit. So psychology and psychologists I believe are in a really good place to be able to support government, to support industry and our communities to navigate these crucial changes. Within your research base studying changes and working conditions will be vital in ensuring evidence-based policy and practice 
and with your frontline experience working strategically, assistance can be provided to support our industry, our work relations and our health, safety and well-being policies right across the UK. So as a profession, I have absolutely no doubt that you will be crucial moving ahead. I wanted to speak just um, as I've introduced this morning a bit about my journey from psychology to MP um, and policymaker and the work of the All Party Parliamentary Psychology Group, which is the first of its kind ever in the House of Commons. So, you know, my background is as a clinical psychologist working in forensic settings and mental health for almost 20 years prior to my first election in 2015. And during this time, I was also privileged to represent many staff um, as their union representative with Unite the Union in our NHS. So that gave me good training and experience of work-related issues, HR policies and legislation. And also had the privilege of um, engaging in negotiation as a member of the Scottish Terms and Conditions Group, helping agree the terms and conditions of NHS staff alongside management and Scottish ministers. In fact, that was the first role I was ever elected to before becoming an MP. So it's true to say you should never forget where you have come from, and I'm very, very proud to retain my identity as a psychologist. In 2015, after the election, I discovered, as has been mentioned this morning, that I'm actually the first clinical psychologist to have been elected as an MP in the House of Commons. So at first, uh, this was uh, announced to me as a, a kind of accolade, I suppose. But upon thinking it through, I felt somewhat surprised, if not shocked. Parliament has so many strengths in the diverse backgrounds of its members and psychologists, I believe, have as much to give going forward within parliamentary sessions as other professions represented there. We have um, diverse professions from teaching, medicine, law, nursing, social work, local government and many other varied professions reflected in our parliament. Psychology should be um, at the forefront of that too. I also have to say that I found psychology was a great benefit to me more generally in my work as an MP too. Be it supporting constituents in weekly constituency surgeries with their problems and issues, to researching perhaps a speech or information for a debate, to working collaboratively across party, yes it can be done, to achieve joint aims in policy development. And of course working in forensic settings um, and as I used to do, uh, scoring up the psychopathy checklist for offenders um, day in, day out in my work has also demonstrated itself as a great transferable skill in moving into party politics. But seriously, once I had learned the mechanics of the chamber and how to get there, the soft and hard skills of psychology have been a great asset to navigating all kinds of stressors over the past few years from Brexit to snap elections, and to, of course, connecting with my constituents. So having chaired the Disability All Party Parliamentary Group for a number of years since 2015, when I first arrived in Parliament, I decided uh, to try to um, start off in the Commons its first All Party Parliamentary Psychology Group, which has run since uh, 2017 to this day. The Secretariat is provided by our British Psychological Society, and each year we run events and roundtable discussions with psychologists, counsellors, psychotherapists, MPs, peers on issues of mental health, children's services, the obesity strategy. We had a session on trauma and also the refugee crisis and many other important issues. Occupational psychologists have so much to contribute to the work of this group moving forward and I would encourage you to contact me if you're interested in attending. Uh, our meetings are virtual too at present but hopefully in the future we will also be in person again uh, once we're in the Commons. Our inquiry report this year is looking at psychological well-being rather than a focus on ill health. What makes for psychological resilience, coping and well-being in our society? What factors in our community should be fostered? And of course, what factors in terms of the workplace and occupational conditions too? Because this is vital in ensuring that we have the best possible chance of strengthening society and our resilience post-COVID against any future pandemics and in terms of supporting individuals and our communities to 
flourish. Much of this will be affected by the environment, as we know, social factors, workplace factors, and lifestyle. So I would hope that this division could provide evidence of support to the government moving forward within our inquiry. The British Psychological Society has also recently completed a report on cognitive strain in Parliament, using interviews with our MPs and their staff across parties. The report's authors have identified some of the key stressors on those working in Parliament and are currently working with House authorities now to enact its occupational recommendations. So I also wanted to take a little bit of time to speak about another important issue that I've been focused on in Parliament for some years and that I think will be key to our objectives of a fair and equal society, both in the workplace and in our communities moving forward. And that's disability equality in the workplace. As I mentioned, I chair the Disability All Party Parliamentary Group. And as part of my remit, I'm supported by having regular meetings with the UK Government Disability Minister, Justin Tomlinson, every few months to discuss and progress important cross party issues. One of these we have discussed is the opportunities that working more flexibly and from home may provide, creating scope for people with disabilities to gain employment, with a view to addressing the key ongoing concern that we have of the disability employment gap across the UK. Diversity and inclusion will be a key factor in levelling up the economy, ensuring that no one is left behind in conjunction with our United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and also with a view towards creating opportunity for everyone. So I'm interested to hear from your conference research and recommendations on these matters. Parliament itself, of course, also has a long way to go to be tru truly reflective of our society at large. And I've always believed that we should walk the walk as well as talk the talk as parliamentarians. So over the past few years, in between all the snap elections and Brexit, I've been working with the Speaker's Office to develop a proposal for paid internships in Parliament for people with disabilities. Interns are given this opportunity now each year to spend 10 months working with MPs across party, breaking down stigma and barriers, building their confidence and connections and changing the narrative. And hopefully many of those who come through our doors in this programme may go on to stand for Parliament themselves with the fundamental aim that they will create the policy themselves they wish to see happen to change people's lives across the UK. It's in its third year now and I've been really humbled, I must say, by the impact it's had on those who have completed the scheme. So my job over the next year, um, or one of my priorities at least, is to think strategically, COVID permitting, about how this could be rolled out to constituency offices, because I'm really aware that I don't want it to be um, entirely London-centric in terms of affording opportunities, and we want the levelling up agenda to happen right across the United Kingdom. Roberta in my office, my office manager, has also been reaching out to ambassadors internationally to establish a similar speakers internship programme or opportunity in other countries. And so far for our event scheduled in the summer, we now have 35 ambassadors signed up to pledge that their countries will work with us to develop these opportunities in parliaments across the globe, which is a truly definitive achievement. So in commerce, as well as in Parliament, it's important to highlight what an asset people with disabilities are to our workforce and organisation. The work of the Down Syndrome Association um, shows us just what can be achieved if we are proactive in our inclusion of those with disabilities in employment practices. Their WorkFit scheme, I was so impressed to hear about and learn more about, was set up to train and assess employers who wanted to include those with Down syndrome in their workforce and to match those with Down syndrome with a role which was well suited to their passions and abilities. And all employers registered with WorkFit received training, which includes their duties under the Equality Act and practical advice on how to make reasonable adjustments. The Down Syndrome Association is also in constant dialogue with companies and organisations who have employees placed with them through this scheme to answer queries that may arise or to work through any difficulties 
situations. It was set up in December 2011 and to date has placed 416 people with Down syndrome in a range of full-time, part-time and volunteer roles, as well as adapted internships. So I'm really keen that these schemes are supported through Parliament in the work that we do, um, as well as the work that we're doing to take forward inclusion within Parliament itself. Um, I'm also incredibly excited to be chairing in Parliament a new all-party parliamentary group this session on inclusive entrepreneurship, which was established in July of last year. In terms of changing the narrative, which is something that I, I keep trying to um, focus upon in terms of my disability inclusion work, I think it's really important uh, we change attitudes and stereotypes and we think about people with disabilities having opportunities to become entrepreneurs and employers as well as employees. So the All Party Group for Inclusive Entrepreneurship was established to remove these barriers to increase numbers and raise the profile of inclusive entrepreneurs across the United Kingdom. There are so many already doing we want to break down the barriers that exist in gaining support. We want to support mentoring schemes moving forward, and we want to um, break down the barriers of access to finance from startup to scaling up, ensuring that everyone who has ability, ideas, and entrepreneurial flair will have the opportunity in the UK to succeed. Our inquiry this year will be taking evidence on barriers faced and recommending policy development that can make a difference. So these are some of the exciting spheres of work in Parliament that I'm utilising my experience as a psychologist and MP to develop. I hope that this division will join me in this journey as you have such a comprehensive contribution to make. Please look out for the all-party parliamentary group as I've mentioned a few this morning. I'm sure your members with their expertise can contribute to them. Look out for mine, of course, but not to be selfish. There are also other groups. Um, run by other cross-party members who are doing absolutely fantastic work in areas relevant to occupational psychology too. Please look out also for debates in Parliament where expertise can be drawn from occupational psychology. Get in touch proactively with MPs who are speaking to provide research briefings from your wealth of experience in the field to ensure uh, that the information given is evidence-based practice. And stay in touch, please, because collaboration makes the journey much more interesting, enjoyable and fruitful. It creates inclusive policy and it sparks new ideas all the time. And it has to be, um, as is uh, at the core of psychology, based upon what works principles. So I want to thank you for having me along to speak today um, to tell you a bit about the work that I've been doing um, with others and uh, the collaborations in the House of Commons that I think are making a real difference and want to continue to make a difference here. And now I'd like to hear from you and try to answer as many questions as you may have of me. Thank you once again. Thank you so much for that, Lisa. All sorts of interesting things in there. And so now we have a good long time. We've got more, got more than half an hour for questions. Um, and there's all sorts of things I want to ask too, but uh, questions are already coming in. Here's an interesting one from Sarah. How open um, to your group's advice do you find the cabinet is? Because from the outside, it can seem immensely frustrating that last minute decisions and changes of mind cause stress for so many. Um, when we know that how important clear communication can be, is there anything that groups like yours can, can you have any influence over? Over, over that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And um, what we try to do, and um, we've done, you know, extremely well, particularly in the Disability Party Parliamentary Group, is to have those regular meetings with uh, the Disability Minister so that he's aware of the agenda um, of the All Party Group, of the inquiry reports, of the recommendations coming through, and that's an ongoing dialogue. Um, what I find psychologically in Parliament is that things don't happen overnight, change doesn't happen overnight. You have to be really persistent, and it's almost like uh, you know breaking down resistance in a way over time. Um, and the more the ideas are discussed and spoken about, the more they become um, researched, they, they become priorities, and then they eventually become accepted. Now, all, uh, totally different all party parliamentary group that, that I chair and I have done for a while, which is based more on a sort of personal interest is the dog welfare group. And uh, we championed Lucy's Law in Parliament um, over the past few years, which was then, um, it became legislation um, in the last parliamentary term. And that was to protect 
um, you know, puppies uh, from uh, puppy dealers and puppy farming, um, and to make sure that the message goes out. And legislatively, that was backed up um, by, uh, you know, uh, the importance of always seeing uh, a pup if you're going to buy one with its mum. Uh, so that's that's you know evidence of something that has made a real change. I think the the part of that that was vital was public support and uh, media support as well in terms of pushing it forward. So it's, it's, it's collaboration between the public, between the group, uh, between the contact with the minister and um, also um, perseverance, which is key. Um, and somebody asked, why is it hard for it to understand the contribution that, that SAI can make? make um, and in particular to helping build the economy um, but I think that also brings us to a broader question of um, how much understanding do you think there is amongst other MPs of the contribution that psychology can have do you find people are interested in the fact that you're a clinical psychologist absolutely um, I think you know it's things happen for a reason and, and it wasn't a massive plan for me to become an MP I, you know I worked as a psychologist very happy in my role um, I tend to see it as a kind of fateful thing and you know now that I'm here I want to really build those connections. I think um, as I mentioned that psychology can have such massive impact in so many areas and an evidence-based impact is really important to me. Um, what I would say is that I, th I think, and I've been working with this on the British Psychological Society, despite having so much to give, and this being an opportune moment because probably 20 years ago, if I'd been elected, mental health wouldn't have been um, such a priority. It wouldn't have been such an open door for a psychological approach um, to helping uh, mental well-being moving forward. It, it's always been much more of a medical model. But I think that we need to do more um, to provide support. So it's a two-way thing in a sense. Um, what I noticed um, as an MP is when debates arise in Parliament, um, be it on obesity or um, could be on refugee crisis, it could be on criminal justice issues, there are lots of um, briefings come from organisations, but very rarely from psychological organisations or the BPS itself. Um, I've been working with them on that because you have so many experts in so many different fields that actually providing that evidence to MPs who then can absorb that and decide uh, that they want to then speak about in Parliament is going to be really key. Um, so I think we need to have more psychologists represented in Parliament as a profession. Um, I certainly can expect to be the first clinical psychologist. Um, you know, in, in, in 2015, you, you would think that that, that would have been a barrier already broken down um, and therefore it has been very much a medical model I think in Parliament for a long time but the timing's right now um, and if we um, as psychologists and um, you know working with the British Psychological Society and, and the other bodies can um, make an effort to collaborate and provide the evidence-based practice and research um, and innovation that we're doing um, and make sure that MPs are aware of it, then that will definitely raise the profile. The timing's right, so please, please use that timing. Correctly. Yeah, so so how can psychologists do that? We have a question from Elizabeth here. How can we how can we further develop the impact and influence that psychologists or social researchers have on, on the decisions that are made? Are, are there ways, if, if psychologists have research they've done, which they feel is very relevant to policy making, what, what, what should they do with it? Absolutely. Well, what I would do if you want to reach out to policymakers is um, a couple of things. Um, I would watch out for debates on the issue that you're, you know your research is based on. Um, look out for those in Parliament who are perhaps raising oral or written questions to government on those issues or issues linked with them and then connect those interested um, politicians across the party. And I would also have a really um, thorough look at the list of all party parliamentary groups that are ongoing in the Commons. Um, there are so many in so many different areas. Um, I chair the health one, as you mentioned, but there are, there are vast numbers of groups that specialise in different aspects of health. Similarly, in terms of so many different areas. So if you have a piece of research um, that's innovative and um, that's going to make a difference and, and, and has that 
um, you know, evidence-based background that you want to present, get in touch with the group that's doing the work on it, look out for their inquiries, but also make sure that you're on the list, um, the contact list for their meetings so that you can begin um, to hear about their work and also think about how the work that you're doing more, more broadly can link to that and, and help support the work in Parliament that's already ongoing. So do you think the reason that psychology has nearly as much of a say, if you have it, they're in economically, at least, but it's not just, so do you think the why psychology has it? Is it just that people don't know what it does and why it could be useful? Um, I think, I know myself when I was training to be a psychologist, you know, and I, I was an assistant and then I, I got on to watch onto the clinical course. There's so much sort of um, effort and, and concentration and, and there's so much competition to, to, to you know, get on in, in the field of psychology itself. Um, that I, and I think also the training courses mean that we're sort of focused on a career pathway in psychology. Um, but we're not perhaps looking at leadership skills in a wider way that perhaps would be helpful in terms of policy development. And I know from speaking um, to a very good friend in the House of Lords, Baroness Hollands, who was previously um, president of the Royal College of Psychiatry, that psychiatrists, um, as part of their training, uh, look very much at leadership and policy development, including links with um, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So that's something that perhaps uh, the training courses in psychology could also begin to develop those ideas and thoughts, um, you know, in terms of their, their trainees um, to take it forward. I think if it, it, I didn't have anything like that when I was um, training and then when I moved into my, my job, it's full on, isn't it? So you, you're kind of focused on service development and being a good as you say, for um, the clients that you're seeing and, and, and NHS initiatives for myself. Um, so I, I think um, the first aspect of that that I was given um, the privilege to be involved in was through my union work rather than psychology work. Um, and that was very much about policy making. So I don't think that as a profession we do enough to support the confidence and um, the involvement of, of our young um, trainees in terms of policy making, development, and building um, those aspirations to influence policy at a high level. Yeah, so some people are suggesting ways that this can be done, that psychologists can buy, for example, the involved in green and white paper and that contributes, and that, of course, strong psychologists uh, say we have seen with the past more orders um behavioral uh behavioral and behavioral on behavior uh, um the ask hazel asks how do we find out the current agenda or decision policy out the all party are discussing how, how can they what you're talking about okay so if um if you were to be looking at the list of all party parliamentary groups online um, then you'll find um, the secretariat for those groups. I would get in touch with the secretariat, make sure that um, you're able to um, connect with them, find out when their meetings are and then it's, it's a collaboration over time really um, where you can find out more about the work that's being done and then um, look at the inquiry reports that are coming up and you'll be in the loop in a sense in terms of the work uh, that's being undertaken in Parliament and how to liaise with that and contribute to it. Yeah, yeah. So we turn my picture off so that my um, sound stays, stays better. Don't fear not. I'm still here. Um, somebody says, oh, and this is interesting, you know, the view of the public view of experts and science has never been very positive, although in the early days of COVID, maybe that increased. But are we facing now expert uh, fatigue or even um, a rejection of experts and science? Is, is, is a rejection of expertise something you've noticed? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is the common narrative, perhaps, um, to some degree, but at the same time with the pandemic, 
we're very reliant upon experts once again. So um, I think it's a balance, isn't it? Because maybe perhaps some of the issues in the past have been that experts um, have worked in a research bubble, perhaps, and just as politicians can sometimes work in a political bubble, and it's not reflected the experiences of society or the community at large. And I think there has to be that, um, you know, resonance for people before they will take things on board. Um, but I do think at times of crisis like this, we do um, see the value of having expert opinion. Um, and expert opinions differ, of course, too. Um, so it's healthy to have that democratic debate about these issues um, and to make sure that voices from different sectors are heard. And I think that that's what's really important is that, you know, um, there is a diversity of voices and then we can take forward an informed decision-making process. And you've mentioned some of the um, particular um, topics that you've been particularly involved with. Do you find, do you think, do you ever notice yourself working perhaps in a different way from other MPs because of your background in clinical psychology? Apart from the interest, does, your, does all your training and experience change the way you work? Well, I've always been able to understand that um, if there are policy divisions or ideological divisions between um, parties on certain issues, but there's still going to be so many more issues that you have in common and that you can um, gain ground on and work together on um, than, uh, you know, than not. I've always had um, a very much kind of reach out attitude um, to finding um, ways of working right across the party and I actually think that that's been so helpful in terms of even just learning about parliament itself. I, I have a number of um, people that, that I've um, built um, relationships with across party that are experienced in perhaps um, the workings of parliament or um, you know, in terms of some of the um, the more theoretical aspects of Parliament that I could go to and ask, um, how does that work? Um, or I could draw on their expertise if they've um, already been working in areas for a long time. So I think you have to have an open mind to, to, to a degree um, and make sure that um, where there is commonality and where a policy can be taken forward that's going to be of great benefit to many people, that you don't let ideology get too much in the way of that and that, that you, you can work collaboratively. Of course, that, that happens. That's not just me. That happens a lot anyway. It's just that that isn't always what's reported in the media. It's maybe not the, the, the um, you know, uh, explosive type uh, media stuff that, that people like to hear about. Um, it, they like to hear about the, the shouting of PMQs and the, the, the controversy rather than the collaboration that goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, that's interesting. Have you found it to be a nicer, a nicer, more collaborative place than people might expect? Yes, and, and I think you need to always remember as well, and perhaps this is a psychologist, that people are human too. So, um, you know, that there's always going to be, if, if there's not a policy connection, there's a human connection and, and you know, just that, smiling at someone saying hello, building up a rapport. Um, having a relationship in a, in a personal way, asking people how they're doing with, you know, if they've been unwell with COVID, for instance, or um, if their families have struggled. Those types of um, just general things that we do at work um, have to be the same, um, you know, in Parliament too. And I find that that's a great help to building um, rapport and um, to being then able to discuss perhaps more difficult issues where there's difference of opinion in, in a really constructive way. And is that regardless of what which party people are from? I mean, do people mix much more than you might expect with MPs from other parties in a, in a, in a friendly way? Absolutely. Um, yeah, because um, most of the work behind the scenes is, you know, on select committees, on, um, you know, delegations, if people are in foreign affairs, perhaps, or... Um, uh, or undertaking a, a select committee inquiry um, means perhaps travelling with, with a group of people, getting to know them. Um, it, it might also be that through the work of the all-party group that you're a vice chair, someone from another party could 
chair, you're, you're working collaboratively on a, on a piece of policy making. So you do you do form um, bonds and, and understanding of people, and you know that doesn't change the fact that you you have different um, party allegiances, but it it doesn't prevent you from working um, to towards a common good in terms of policy making. And you I might mean, not get everything you want, you know, but. Yeah. I think that that, we, we know that, you know, as yeah. psychologists, it's, it's a win-win, isn't it, you're looking for, you, you don't expect to get everything. Um, so, yeah, I think those those skills and that, that understanding of the soft skills of psychology has been really helpful to me as well. And I wonder what it was like, looking back to 2015, what it was like when you started and, and how does that whole process work at the beginning? How on earth do you find out how to how you should be an MP, you know, after your first day, what, what are you supposed to do? Can you talk me through that? Yeah, well, I mean, I didn't even know how to get there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I had a map and everything. <laughs> I arrived and uh, we were elected on the Thursday um, evening, uh, sort of over to the Friday morning, you, you know, everyone's seen it on the television. But then uh, by the Monday we were in Parliament, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a shock to the system although you've been building up to the possibility it's, it can be quite a shock to the system you know particularly if your seat hasn't you know been one that your party held before or that you've been expected to take then um, it's a massive change so I arrived on the Monday with the map <laughs> and uh, they set up a buddy system. So I was really fortunate um, that the buddy I had is one of the um, people who, who uh, runs up uh, some of the house services. And uh, he, his job really for the first week was to show me how to get from my office to the chamber <laughs> <laughs> and, and to run through basic things with me, how to fill out forms, get, you know, get sort of things up and running. Um, because many people coming into Parliament, well, most people, and actually I think it's good to have people coming into Parliament that don't have, you know, um, a history of having been um, in career politics beforehand. So, so the more people that, that come from diverse backgrounds, the better. Um, but it does mean that you need a, quite a bit of support to, to start off. And as I said, psychology really helped me. Um, you know, I'm not frightened to ask a question, even if it sounds a bit daft. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to build those relationships um, that, that you need in a workplace. And, and also, um, I think, um, making sure that, that you're aware of other people who might be struggling too and, and reaching out to them who, you know, there, there, there's been many new MPs come in in the past um, year and perhaps what would have happened if we hadn't had COVID and all been working from home as you would have um, been much more involved in trying to support new MPs coming through as well and, 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 and learning the rope um, for those coming behind you. And do you remember well the first time you spoke in the House of Commons? Yeah, well, my maiden speech, I honestly, um, I, I, by that point, I think I was a bit more confident, but it was very nerve wracking. Um, but you are struck when you arrive that the, the actual chamber is a bit smaller than it mm -hmm. seems from when you're looking at it on the mm -hmm. television. Um, so, and, it, and it was sort of a bit in, I didn't do it straight away. Um, you had people who were very gung ho and wanted to do it straight away. <laughs> and I wanted to sort of see how, how it went first for other people and what worked and what didn't and, and how to then kind of gauge what I was going to do. Um, but I remember at first thinking, oh my goodness, I'm so anxious. What if I faint? <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I used all my powers of psychology and anxiety management. <laughs> and I <laughs> think to myself, so I think myself about using psychological techniques and ridiculous there's people in here that you've heard ask really ridiculous questions. <laughs> you're as you're as good as them, you'll be fine. So I was giving myself all that positive reassurance and <laughs> trying <laughs> try not to feel out of my depth having come from the NHS straight to Parliament. <laughs> yeah, yeah, such a such a different world. Um, and people watching, do keep putting uh, your questions into the. Um, well, there's more things I want to ask, but do do keep putting your questions into the Q and A there, um, so that I can put those to Lisa. And since then, um, what has being an MP been? How you've expected it to be, or are there things where you thought I didn't think it would be quite like this, whether they're good or bad? But how different has it been from your idea of it? 
I'm not sure that I had a very good idea as to what MPs did, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think society is that aware of what MPs do other than getting the price of a pint of milk wrong and being seeming a bit removed from society. So I think that kind of stayed with me and I decided that I wanted to make sure I didn't get caught up in a sort of Westminster bubble as such. And so I spent quite a lot time in my constituency um, with groups, organisations. Um, I hold, um, well, everything's virtual just now, but I hold um, surgeries in each part of the constituency every week. So I try and keep my knowledge and, my, and I keep tapped into the, you know, what's actually happening on the ground. I think that's really important. Um, what an MP does, I, I, I think that there's an underestimation of what an MP does as well. And I remember from my union, <laughs> Right, saying when I started, well, you know, um, about a contract and 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 um, working times and that kind of thing. People just sort of laughed and said, "Well, you just work. You just, you know, you if something happens, you have to get on with it." And that's absolutely true. If something happens, you're there and you have a responsibility to your constituents and your constituents, and you have to respond. Um, so I, I I don't know that I had thought it would take up so much time in terms of family time as well. And I think that's maybe something that, that we need to reflect on in terms of work-life balance for MPs. And I think the, the work that the British Psychological Society are doing in terms of stressors um, for um, parliamentary staff um, and mm -hmm. MPs is, is going to be important in terms of looking at some of those issues. Um, you know, if you have children, it, it can be difficult. You don't want to be, you don't want to be, you know, I'm a mum as well. so. I, I don't want to miss um, first that happen, but I have missed some of those um, regretfully uh, because I've been in London when they happen, but, um, you know, or Brexit's happened. So I, I think I've got a better understanding now of some of the sacrifices that MPs make um, in order to represent their constituents well. Um, but no, I didn't. I didn't have a clear idea of what an MP did, and, and I don't remember. And I, I do go out to schools and speak about politics and, and being an MP and, and what that means and, and the work, so that people have an awareness. Because that, that didn't happen when I was at school. But you know, I think it, it, it's important to have um, an understanding of the job um, of those who are representing your community and how to contact them and reach out. Yeah, and with those, um, I think it, it's really interesting, those stresses on constituency staff and the sorts of uh, things that they are, are having to deal with and the very sometimes traumatic, difficult stories they're having to deal with. Has that been, um, I mean, that must have been made harder by the pandemic. Yeah, it has. I mean, even, um, you know, we looked at the figures over the past year, our constituency inquiries have trebled. Um, and, and they were, you know, high to start with. So that's been reflected in the fact that we've had to take on additional staffing to, to um, meet that demand because we can't just be overloading those who are already there and working, you know, um, full pelt, so to speak, already. So um, that has been reflected in, in, in a sense that um, the speaker's been very good at recognising the additional demands. Um, placed upon constituency offices and, and to make sure that, that staff have adequate, um, you know, computerised um, stations and printers and all the things you would need to work from home that we've never really um, had in place before. So all that's had to be put in place um, and uh, to make sure that staff are safe um, and, and, and working. Um, with support that they need and also emotional and well-being support and, and the, the speaker is really leading on that and is, is doing a great job because um, I think well-being of staffing is, is an issue that, that has needed to be addressed and, and um, in the last parliament I was part of the Commons Inclusion uh, and uh, Representation Reference Group so um, John Berkow was, was leading on some of that work too. So. Um, it's been important that that's been continued um, by uh, Lindsay Hoyle, who's, who's, who's really um, focused on that and prioritising staff wellbeing. So do you think things are changing when it comes to how seriously mental health is, is taken um, in Parliament? And that is it becoming sort of, I don't know, a bit less, a bit less macho and a bit more, you know, inclusive in terms of we need to look after people's wellbeing. And just because you've decided to be an MP, it doesn't mean that you need to put your own wellbeing at risk. 
Yes, um, I think that that's a lot better though. There are services if someone is struggling that they're able to contact confidentially and have some support. And you know, we know as psychologists that well being and mental health you know, on a continuum and it can affect any of us at any, any time. Um, and uh, there shouldn't be a stigma in, in you know, seeking support. Um, I think more MPs are speaking out about their own mental health issues and struggles and stresses they've had. Um, I have to really take my hat off to um, members of the Royal Family who have spoken about the trauma they've experienced in their lives and um, how they've struggled at times with mental health issues and it made it, you know, um, something that, that people can say that can affect anybody, no matter your background, your station in life, um, and that mental health is something that we should come forward and seek support for. And do you think that occupational psychology could make, uh, occupational psychologists could make a difference? If you had some occupational psychologists come into, uh, you know, to Parliament to see, you know, how things are run or to advise, to consult, would that be something that would be useful? Would you, could things be changed? I mean, can you see better ways of doing things? Yeah, absolutely. And you have to, to know that if, you know, occupational psychologists are the experts in many of these fields, they have to come forward if they don't, someone else who's perhaps not such an expert will come forward and take that place. So um, it's important, I think, um, you know, and uh, I've had some briefings through um, and, 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 and it was something that I hadn't noticed. Um, originally, because you have to think of an, an MP as almost like a GP, so not a specialist generally in particular areas, um, and having to move from subject to subject very rapidly and relying very much on the information that they have at their fingertips, but maybe not having the time to go and truly really, um, evidence base everything that they're given. And I've had some briefings through that. I've known because of my mental health background and psychology background that I've thought I wouldn't say that in the chamber. I don't, you know, that's not the guidance. That's not um, nice guidance. So I wouldn't go in and say that that's effective, but that's given to people. It's sent on from um, various professional groups and um, then that's what's repeated. So I would really call out to occupational psychologists and um, to the British Psychological Society of the work that we've been doing to make sure um, that there is that evidence-based um, expert opinion that comes in um, that's, that's, you know, from those who are, are reputable and, and very renowned in the field. And I think occupational psychology has a lot to offer. So please do get in touch, get involved um, with, even if the first group you get involved with is a psychology one, just to find out how these things work, um, then we can put you in touch with other um, all-party groups where you might be able to support some of the policy work that's moving forward. Yes, I think that's really interesting. And we're having people asking how they, how they can get involved. So it's a question of uh, contacting uh, an all-party group on a particular subject where you have some expertise to offer. What and just an offering to give them summaries that might be useful. I'm guessing what people don't want is a load of, to be sent a load of papers to read, you know, journal papers to read, for example. <laughs> No, <laughs> as psychology, I, I have this discussion a lot of because psychologists find it difficult. I mean, I suppose I have as well in the past, find it difficult to tear down things into one sheet of A4. Please do that. Um, MPs are, are looking for what the issues are, um, you know, what you're doing, um, what would make a difference and practical recommendations that could work. As short as one side of A4? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, the most too, because... You, there's going to be lots of policy briefings from different organisations coming in and you want, you want, you really want to know what's going to make a difference so that you can speak to something and you also want, um, you want to reflect perhaps more than one organisation's work in your speeches as well and typically, um, you, you know, you're speaking only for minutes, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is a very good call for, for people to get involved there and for people to see uh, psychology and occupational psychology having more of an impact. We will leave it there. But thank you so much for everybody for sending their questions. And thank you so much, Dr. Lisa Cameron. Very good luck with everything uh, you're working on. Um, and uh, to everybody else, uh, do join me again at uh, 10 past 10 in the next uh, session where we will be uh, hearing from David Murphy and we will be hearing all about how uh, 
psychology has risen to the uh, challenges, the many challenges of the COVID pandemic. But thank you so much again, Dr. Lisa Cameron. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone.